I am glad to be able to welcome you into the study tonight as we look at some of the lies that we believe. Now, that is not what we should do, and you might not expect a preacher to tell you, well, these are the lies we believe. Unfortunately, we have looked at lies that people believe that affect them adversely. And this is why telling the truth is so important, especially the truth, the truth that is God's Word. Uh, because, as Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Now, we've looked at two lies over two weeks. One of them is, uh, I must be perfect. Remember, the lie of perfectionism. Uh, this is where workaholics and alcoholics and other people find their source of irritation uh, because they feel like, I got to be perfect. You say, well, I don't know too many uh, alcoholics that are, are perfectionists. Well, that's the thing. They are uh, perfectionists that have given up. And, and that's, a, that's a whole other realm that we'll have to talk about at another time. Last week in particular, we looked at one of the religious lies that we believe. Now, these have been stirred because of the, this is a really good little book uh, by Dr. Chris Thurman. It's a book uh, by a Christian counselor. And he identifies a number of these falsehoods that affect our attitude, it affects our hope, it affects our behavior, and it affects our relationships. Last week we looked at the one, the, uh, the lie that I must earn God's love. Now you know everywhere else in life, this world says you gotta earn it. You got to earn it. You gotta, you gotta earn your way to, to, to make good grades. You gotta earn your way to get a good job. You gotta earn your way to get a good reputation. And sometimes that won't even work. People that slander you in, in spite of your hard work. But the love of God is something that existed for you before you existed. Give that a second. Let that soak in. The love of God existed for you before you existed. Why is that? Because God in his foreknowledge saw the first person that was created, and he's going to see the last person who dies on this planet. He's going to see everybody in between. And from the foundation of the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, which means at the very beginning, God the Father knew that the devil would go off the farm, he would come to earth, he would smear his sinfulness all over the human race by tempting them that they would fall into sin and therefore would be on their way to death and a Christless eternity. And so before the first people were formed out of the dust of the earth, Eve out of the rib of Adam, before they experienced the breath of life and became a living soul, before the garden was planted eastward of Eden, before even God said, let there be light and there was light, God loved you and God loved me. Now, I balked at this statement the first time I heard someone say it because I had bought the lie because everything else in, li in life you have to earn I bought the lie that you have to earn God's love. And somebody straightforward, mature in the faith, reading the Bible, uh, expository preaching what the Bible was saying, said, there is nothing you can do to get God to love you more or to get God to love you less. Because his love is not based on my performance or your performance. His love is not based on what I do or what I don't do. His love is based on who he is. In 1 John, the aged apostle wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, God is love. He's a lot of other things but he is the totality of what real love is. Fellas, you want to love your wife? Get the love of God in your heart. Ladies, you want to love your husband, your family? Get the love of God in your heart. 
because God has love for everybody. And we talked about that a little bit in Sunday school. Brother Billy uh, brought this out that we, we don't have to like folks to love them. We can love the folks we don't like. Anybody believe that? All right, I'm looking for you tomorrow morning in traffic. Uh -huh. When they steal your parking place, when they jump ahead of you in the shopping line. Okay, that's the other lie we looked at last week. This week we're going to look at a couple of them. Now these are lies that affect marriage. We're going to look at the lie, and they're going to look at what God's Word says about these things. And that way we can measure what is false by what is unchangeably true. Now you and I oftentimes fall for the lies of the devil because our emotions buy into it. We'll, we'll fall for the lies of the devil because our experience will buy into it. I mean, I spent 19 years of my life being a loser. Someone outside of the, the, the circle of God's fellowship. I, I didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in me. I didn't have the ability to do the things that God has given me the ability to do freely now as uh, through the operation of his grace. And I would buy into so many lies because my experience said, well, you know, that must be true because it seems to happen that way over and over. How about, how about this one? Just I'll throw this out here and then we'll get into the subject real quick. Um, have you ever heard the saying, and I have used it, no good deed goes unpunished. Have you ever? Yeah. And you know, your experience tells you, you help somebody out and it's going to turn around and bite you. Am I telling you the truth or what? I mean, it, at least the truth of our experience. But you see... That's only because we're looking at the short range. You know, there's things that I have done in my life that in the short range, all it did was cost me. But in the long run, all it did was bless me. And when we live life in the sight of the living God, who will judge all people, thank God on the basis of his grace, those who believe, then we will see things not as, well, if you do good, it's going to cost you. No, no. If you do good, it's going to bless the Lord because it's the Lord at work in you to do good if it's really good. Okay, that's another thing. We'll set that aside. All right, we're going to look at one of the lies that affect marriage. I'm going to read a couple of, uh, of quotes. I like, um, Dr. Thurman sounds like a really good Christian counselor. I'm going to read a couple of different counseling sessions, or at least a portion of them, and uh, it'll kind of set the stage. First of all, the first lie we're going to deal with is, uh, by the way, if you don't have one of these books, there are one, two, three, four of them sitting right there on that front pew. So I haven't read every word of this book, but I have gone through it and it's worth reading. It's not real complicated. It's not one of these counseling manuals. It just talks about the truth and how we need to know the truth that it can set us free. So the first one is, uh, have you ever heard this lie? All of our marriage problems are my spouse's fault. Did you know that... Uh, in the Old Testament, there was such a thing as a scapegoat. Now, it had a legitimate purpose, and it was established by God. And that scapegoat, scapegoat was a part of a very intricate process of atonement. And I'll, I, but he, he still didn't take away the sin of the people. It, it would, God would cover the sins of the people when, in faith, they offered the sacrifice, and part of that sacrifice was not only the, the ram that was slain, the lamb that was slain, but the scapegoat that was led out into the wilderness. Now, when we use the term scapegoat, you know what I'm saying. We're saying it's all their fault. You know, most companies that you will work for, you're going to have a certain number of people in that organization that are always looking for a scapegoat. You know, they don't care so much whether the company uh, survives or prospers. All they want is to be sure they keep their job. And so some people keep them a, a, a middle checklist 
of somebody they can blame. You know, well, well, I would have done my job, but so-and-so, you know, they kept me from doing it. They got in the way. They didn't supply the supplies that I needed and blah, blah, blah. And that's being a scapegoat. You know what? This is not just in the workplace. This is not, you ever you hear the, <laughs> the father and son over the backyard fence and the and you can tell they're, they're, he's, the little boy's got the bat in his hand and the dad is throwing the ball and the little boy says in exasperation, Dad, you missed my bat again. We do this with people. So here's a lie we want to identify. We want to, we want to, uh, I noticed in the, the Gulf War when my son was serving in the army, I watched the news all the time and they would, uh, a certain uh, uh, platoon would go in and they would paint an object with a laser beam. They would shine a laser beam on an object and the, the jet coming in would have a missile that would hone in on that uh, beam and it would go right for where it was painted with that uh, laser beam. We want to paint this lie as a destructive lie that we don't need to believe anymore. Now let's go to a counseling session. You're gonna love these two people, and uh, I say that facetiously. I'm only gonna read a, a page and a half or so, but I want you to get the benefit of the actual counseling session. By the way, this is The Lies We Believe by Dr. Chris Thurman, and uh, it's, it's good reading, and I wanna share this excerpt. Um, okay. In the counseling session, the, the wife speaks up first. What he did destroyed our marriage, she spewed during our most recent session. How so, I asked, this is the counselor saying, knowing full well what she was saying. I will never be able to trust him again. I can't even bear to look at him. I could just kill him, she exploded. That's pretty serious. The doctor says, I know you're in a lot of pain over this, Patty and understandably so. At the risk of sounding insensitive though, I want you to explore something. I want to explore something with you, okay? Okay, she said with hesitation in her voice. We have been talking about what your husband did for a while now. And we spent a lot of time focusing on how much you hurt and how much this has damaged your ability to trust him and respect him. It is what I haven't heard from you that concerns me, he said. She said, what do you mean? Well, I haven't heard you say anything about yourself. About me? Yes, about you. Well, what is there to say about me in all this? I didn't have an affair. I didn't break our vows. I didn't betray him. What have I got to do with any of this, she said defensively. Don't you think it takes two to make a marriage what it is? I asked. Woo. He's playing with hot things around the powder keg here. Yes, but are you saying it's my fault that he had an affair? She was almost yelling. No, not at all, the counselor replied. That was his choice. And it was a very selfish, destructive choice. What I'm saying is that I'm concerned about the fact that you haven't said anything about the part you played in the marriage not being a good one. From what you have said, his affair is the only reason the marriage is in trouble. And I understand, I, I, if you read the, the background on this, he, he wasn't negating the seriousness of this situation, but he was trying to identify with another problem that was being overlooked. What I'm saying is that I'm concerned about the fact that you haven't said anything about the part you have played in the marriage not being a good one. From what you've said, his affair is the only reason the marriage is in trouble. From that, I would take it that you don't think you have done anything wrong, I stated, knowing full well I was on pretty thin ice. Well, sure, I've done some things wrong, she begrudgingly admitted, but nothing like this. He's wrecked everything, and I don't know if I can ever love him again. Let me ask you this. 
before you found out about the affair, would you say that you were more loving toward your husband than he was toward you? What do you mean? Do you believe that you were more caring, supportive, attentive, affectionate, understanding, and so on? Yes, I was, she said without missing a beat. Were you all of those things all of the time? No, but who is? I met a lot more of his needs than he met of mine, she bragged. But there were ways that you didn't meet his needs when you should have, right? Of course, but I didn't have an affair, though. He did. Should I just act like this no big deal and sweep everything under the rug? No. What he did was a big deal. And sweeping it under the rug only allows it to fester. I just wonder how your marriage is ever going to heal if you aren't willing to do what he has already done. What, have an affair? No. He has come clean about what you have, what you have done in the marriage that has, excuse me, He's saying to the woman, you need to come clean about what you have done in the marriage that has contributed to it being so troubled. You seem to have a pretty bad case of the all our problems are his fault syndrome. And you are looking right past the part that you have played. You see, this happens way too often. We have an amazing ability because of our imagination to deny what we have done and to have a fit over what someone else has done. I didn't really understand this statement until after I thought about it an hour or so later. One wise preacher said, there is nothing wrong with my wife that fixing me won't cure. And I thought, that's maturity. It doesn't mean that we ignore the faults of others. It doesn't mean that we diminish the faults of others. It's just that if you're a good doctor and you take an x-ray, if there's a dark area over here, you don't go to seed on that one. If there's another dark area over here, Maybe inside the same human body are two symptoms of two dangerous things. But if you only focus on one, the whole body is going to suffer. You get the point? All our marriage problems are my spouse's fault. You know, Jesus had a unique approach to solving problems between people. You know, it has a lot to do with our personal focus. If my focus is, you're wrong, let's deal with you, without saying, I might have contributed to that, let's deal with me at the same time, then you're not looking for, for sources of healing. You're looking for opportunities to make that person a scapegoat. Now, they say in literature and in music, you only hurt the one you love, the one you should never hurt at all. And you know, that's sort of a truism. You know, it's not necessarily a, a total fact, but it's a truism in the sense that oftentimes we take for granted the love and the forgiveness and the, the commitment of someone that we shouldn't take for granted. And we try to dump all of our anger and our frustration on them. We use them for a scapegoat. But you know what? The problem doesn't go away. This is why fire departments, when they're called out to, to put out a, a, a fully engulfed structure, when they spray it down and get it to the point that there's no more visible flames, they're not done yet. Because there's gonna be a smoldering thing here and a smoldering thing there. 
If you know anything about wildfire, man, we used to have them in, in Florida, in the Ocala National Forest, just north of where we were. Every May, there were fires in the Ocala National Forest, it seems, and the smoke would come blowing into our county, and boy, it would be dark and gray and choky and smoky. And it's because they'll go in and put out a fire, but there'd be some old stump somewhere just to smoldering. If they don't put that thing out, it's going to spread. In the case of a wildfire, it's not just that that old stump is the problem, but this old stump is smoldering too. Both of them are the source of danger. Both of them are the source of a problem. You know, the old saying, it takes two to tango, is a truism as well. It takes two to build a relationship but it also takes two to develop a conflict. And if two people are both working together for the same goal, healing, wholeness, forgiveness, growth, that's a good environment. But when one is admitting they're wrong and trying to repent of it and the other is just rubbing it in. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 3, some of the most convicting words in the Bible. How many of you were really touched by this the first time you read it? Can you remember? I was 19 years old when I read this for the first time that I actually understood it. Jesus said, why are you beholding? Why are you giving your full attention to the tiny speck thing. The word in the old King James is the moat. Tiny little speck. How many of you ever got a little speck in your eye? You know what? When it's in your eye, it's a big deal, isn't it? Huh? It doesn't have to be very big. Your eye starts watering. You can't see. It hurts. And the more you mess with it, the worse it gets. Jesus was being very practical. Now, he's not talking about eye health here. He's talking about the health of relationships. He says, why are you focusing on the moat that is in your brother's eye, but consider not the, are you ready for this? The log that is in your own eye. A beam was a piece of log. They, they didn't dress in, in common carpentry unless it was in a rich person's house in the first century. They didn't dress those logs. We, we saw some uh, dwellings in the, the cave dwellings in Colorado at Mesa Verde. And uh, the beams for the ceiling of many of those cave dwellings made out of clay up under these cliff uh, areas, they were uh, pieces of, of pinon pine, probably at uh, the biggest four, five, six inches around. That was the beam. They were big. Now I say, why do we see that? What, what, what does it have to do with the subject? They were over a thousand years old and in that dry environment, they, they didn't go away. So I, we know what beams looked like thousands of years ago. And Jesus said, you're all focused on some tiny speck that's in somebody else's eye but you're missing the fact that you have a log hanging right there between your eye and your eyelid. Now you say, that is ridiculous. Well, so is straining at gnats and swallowing camels. But Jesus took the ridiculous things to say, hey, this is what you're doing and it's ridiculous too. Let's read on. Or how can you say to your brother, let me pull the spirit Speck the moat out of your eye, and behold, a log, a beam is in your own eye. How many of you would like to go to a dentist and him fire up his drill and he has a big old two by four sticking out of his eye? You say, uh uh, <laughs> Doc, before you get in this mouth, you got to get that thing out of your eye because I know you can't see well. I almost said see good, and that wouldn't be correct. Jesus is saying, if we are exclusively focused on the faults of others, we can't see very well. And so he says, as a conclusion in verse 5, 
he really brings the whole package together here. I think this is one of the most complete teachings in the Bible outside of the wonderful gospel of Jesus. This is so complete because it identifies the problem, it identifies the scope of the problem, the extent of what it can do, and it provides a solution. In verse 5 he says, you hypocrite. And now, now understand, when you make people to be your scapegoat, you are practicing big time hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? It's acting. It comes from the word hypocritas, which means to wear a mask. And to wear a mask means to pretend something that is not true. You are not that person, you're just pretending to be that person. And Jesus said when we go to seed, when we obsess over a tiny speck that's in somebody else's eye, but we have a log in our own eye, we are total hypocrites because we're trying to say they're the problem, but not me. And that's hypocrisy. He said, you hypocrite first. Now remember, when Jesus spoke to people that were hypocrites, he called them hypocrites. But what was the position that he spoke from? What are we told to do as Christians? We are told to speak the truth in love. Now when Jesus spoke this truth and called this person a hypocrite, whoever it is, he was calling it like it was, but he was speaking out of a position of love. You know, condemnation is going to come soon enough. There's going to be a final judgment. And Jesus, being the Son of Man, is the judge of both the living and the dead. He will judge because he is the Son of Man. That's what he said. But before the time of condemnation comes, he's speaking from the position of love and of mercy, of remedy. You know, there's two ways to attack a problem. One is punitive. Let's find somebody to punish. Uh, Washington runs on that. The other way to, to go toward problem solving is to be therapeutic. By the way, uh, blaming somebody never solves anything. Therapeutic means let's find the source of the problem and let's fix it. And if this person is the cause of that, let, let's fix the person so they'll stop being the source of the problem. The one is just to, uh, punitive. We want to punish them. Isn't that, what's, isn't that what's going on in politics today? They're all punishing one another. They're ranting about one another. They're condemning one another. There's, you know, God says, here, the God of the universe says to pipsqueak little man, come, let us reason together. Come on, let's work it out. But the person who's looking for a scapegoat is not saying, come, let us work it out. They're saying, come, let's blame you for the whole problem because I'm in denial. I don't want to look at my part of the problem. You know why I can speak on this subject so fluently? <laughs> because I'm like David when Nathan the prophet pointed his finger at him. He said, thou art the man. Every one of us have been there and done this. We've all, little kids, you know, in the nursery, they want to blame somebody else. As soon as they have the vocabulary to be able to say it, they want to blame somebody else. I didn't break it. <laughs> and usually the, the one that says, I didn't break it first, they're usually the one that did break it. So Jesus said, here, you first cast the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast the moat out of your brother's eye. Wow. Now remember the, the moat and the beam. Think about this. I, now this is just my opinion. Don't take this too much. But if it's in somebody else's eye, it's very small. But when it's in your eye, it's very big. Hold your hand out like that. It doesn't take away 2% of your field of vision. Hold your hand up like this. I just took 50% of my field of vision right away. It's gone. You see? When it's in somebody else's eye. And, you know, again, only the scapegoat finder is looking to assign the percentage of the blame. 
You know, sometimes we get so obsessed on saying, well, it's mostly your fault. But if we would just be seeking for solutions, get what's blinding you first. The reason this, by the way, this couple ended up divorcing. The husband came and confessed his sin and wanted to reconcile, but there was no reconciliation. And the, the counselor said, it's because this woman said, I just want somebody to blame. And woe to the man that, that tries to court her after this because he's going to fall under the same uh, judgment. Our marriage problems are our problems. And when we solve them together, and when we are looking to assist the other one, rather than scrambling to maintain some silly concept of self-esteem, you know, the legalist, the perfectionist is usually the person that likes to look for somebody to blame because they like to cover their own sins by what other people do. Let's move on. There's another lie that's often spoken in marriage, and I'll just take a few minutes for this, and, uh, but it's, 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 worth, uh, it's worth looking at. The second one is, the, this is the lie. If our marriage takes hard work, we must not be right for each other. You know, there have been couples that come to pastors and to Christian counselors, oh, maybe a year or two into their marriage, and they say, sir, I, we, don't, we, we must not be God's will for each other. We're wondering if we need to get divorced because it just doesn't seem to be working out. It's just really hard. Now, a good counselor and a good pastor will say, you know what that means? That means you're probably well suited to one another. You're just not learning how to work together. Jesus talked about being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That does make it very difficult. To be unequally yoked, period, means to have one animal in a yoke that stands real tall and another one that's real short, and they're going to end up with a broken neck or at least rip the flesh. It's going to be a horrible situation. But outside of the business, and by the way, you, you screen <laughs> that unequally yoke before you get married. But even in marriage, the Apostle Paul said, well, work with them. Work with them because you don't know. You might win them to the Lord, you see. If marriage takes hard work, we must not be right for each other. In contrast to this, Dr. Thurman says, any marriage that has achieved any closeness through the years has been worked on. He said again, marriage takes hard work, tremendously hard work work. Let me read a little bit and then we'll wrap up. Any marriage that has achieved in intimacy through the years has been worked on. It's a truth though that very few understand. So the moment marriage isn't easy or smooth, a lot of couples begin to uh, think, well, we must not be right for each other. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have to work so hard. Dr. Thurman went on to say, lately, I've, I've been seeing a couple in therapy who fit this scenario. Cheryl and Stan have been married less than a year, and they fight about something almost every day. Large things, small things, anything. They have few interests in common, and they feel bored with each other. They spend little time together talking about how they feel because they find it painful. Their attitudes have spilled over into their sexual life, which is cold at best. They call it quits, except that they're both afraid to be alone and worried about how their friends and family would react. That sounds like a real deep, deep concern. No, it's shallow. They habitually sit in the two uh, single chairs in my office, a king, king and a queen, sitting regally, rigidly in their individual thrones. Cheryl, self-assured and immaculately dressed, stands slouched and always in slacks and a rumpled sports shirt. Typically, they start the session blaming each other and wondering out loud if they're hopelessly mismatched. By the way, if you said I do, and they said I do, you are God's best for each other, okay? I need to get an amen on that. 
you are now, by virtue of the fact that you've made a vow before holy God, and there's, there was no reason why you could not be lawfully joined together. Now, that we, there's crazy things going on today that might, you know, be an exception to what I'm saying, but I'm not, I'm talking about you're, you, you have the right under God to be lawfully married together. You have now become God's best for one another. Not the easiest choice. There are some uh, couples coming back from World War II who, who married a, a French bride or a German bride or a Japanese bride. And they couldn't even speak the same language. You talk about hard work. I've tried to coax them to, to back off and look honestly at their personal styles. I know how frustrated you both must be with the problems in your marriage, I said one day, but I don't think it necessarily means that you're wrong for each other. Well, it doesn't. If it doesn't, then what else could it mean, Stan shot back? Well, one thing your problems could mean is that both of you have serious flaws. By the way, <laughs> you may be God's best for each other, but you both have serious flaws. Do you know that? You, we are a fractured, broken, needy human race. And everyone that gets married, both male and female, is flawed. Okay? I mean, that's, that's a given. I know you can do horse trading. You can look and feel them over in their constitution and check their teeth and, you know, look at their vet record and everything. But there's always some hidden problem in there. Same thing in marriage. Your fights are a symptom of how, how much both of you have to work on. Stan rolled his eyes. What do you mean? Well, Stan, you two fight over how often you watch sports, right? Is it possible that you are being somewhat selfish in how much time you spend doing that? I knew he didn't want to hear me say something like that. He stiffened. Well, I love watching football. It helps me relax. You're not asking me to give that up, are you? Of course not. It's not my place to ask you to give it up. It's more important whether you think you should cut back some to help your marriage. It's got to come from you. I'm just trying to get you to entertain the possibility that the fight you two are having over this issue could mean that you have some flaws to work on. To work on. To work on. Quickly, most of you ladies understand intuitively from the time you're a three-year-old child what a relationship is. Boys do not discover what a relationship is until they're 25 or 30. We are clueless. By the way, if you've got sisters, sisters teach your brothers what a relationship is. You know, you, you look at kids in, in preschool and kindergarten, first and second grade, the little girls are talking and chatting and making friends. Little boys are running around, slapping each other, rolling on the ground, wrestling. They're all kinetic. But they don't understand what relationships are. Now, you know, God didn't give Adam everything. He gave Eve a chunk of that rib. He gave Eve some things that he needed to learn. And generally, we marry someone who has qualities we lack and wish we had. And they marry us because we have qualities that they would like and wish that they had. And the whole business of the friendship that we call marriage is that process of working together in harness together for the good of both. And it's going to take work. I want to read the Darby translation of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Now listen carefully and see if there is some sweat equity in genuine love. Love has long patience and is still kind. Love is not emulous, jealous of others. Love is not insolent, and rash, love is not puffed up, thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Love does not behave itself in an unseemly manner, does not seek what is its own, is not quickly provoked, does not impute evil, 
does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, bears all things. The D-I-V-O-R-C-E word needs to be removed from your vocabulary. You do not threaten it. You do not imply it. Love never fails. It, it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. You know what that means? You got to work at it. Marriage takes hard work. And if it's hard, that means it's worth it. Can I just be openly personal for just a moment? My wife is cringing. Oh, no, what is he going to say now? We have had classic disagreements that have lasted over periods of time. But we are both better people because through the process we have learned that it's the us that are doing this together that it's not what I get out of marriage it's what we get out of this partnership that we have I just throw out this other one and I gotta, gotta be done I won't even take time to elucidate and you're saying thank God here's another lie write this one down my spouse owes me. And you can fill in the blank any way you want to. It's a lie. This is the song of selfishness. My spouse owes me. Ephesians chapter 4, 32 says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. See, there's the soft side of it. They don't owe you anything. You owe them. In, 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 in first, no, Romans chapter 13, it says, owe no man anything but what? To love them. You owe them the love of your heart, the God-given love that he'll put within you if you're willing to receive it. I read in, in the hard side of this, my spouse owes me. This is where you're carrying the grudge. Jesus uh, taught in, in Matthew, excuse me, Luke 6. He also taught in Matthew. In Luke 6, 37, he says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Many spouses have been condemned to a life of owing the other spouse. And they're always calling in their marker. They're always calling in their marker. They're always calling, you owe me, you owe me, you owe me. Let me tell you something. That's a lie. You owe them forgiveness. To finish the verse, condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Jesus told us when he taught the Lord's Prayer to the disciples that if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Don't say, my spouse owes me, lest you realize that God's going to say, okay, you owe me a debt. You remember the parable of the guy that owed the king $10 million and then grabbed a hold of his servant friend who owed him about 5000 King forgave him and he wouldn't forgive this guy of a little debt. The end of that story is that he was turned over to the tormentors and he was going to stay there until he paid the last farthing don't be that person. Well, we touched on a few things. I've stirred up enough hornets tonight. Oh, we're going to have things to talk about tonight. We're going to drive to Florida tonight. We're going to talk about these things. Let's try to identify the lies that stand between us so that the truth can bind us together. And let's, you know, I have a garden, and all of a sudden now I see a few weeds sprouting up. And when you see that weed coming, I know what it looks like. I know what the, 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 the produce looks like. I know what the weed looks like. When you identify a weed, you know what you do with it? You pull that sucker up and get it out of your garden. Because otherwise, it will prosper, it will multiply, and it will squeeze out the good stuff. 
Let's weed out the lies that we have believed, that our culture has believed and taught us, and let's build the truth in our lives. Pray with me. Father, we know that you're good, that you love us and you want us to have peace. You want us to be a blessing. You want our relationships, whether it be marriage or just friendship, whether it be brotherly love or sisterly love in all of our relationships. Oh, Lord, help us to walk in the truth toward one another, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.